Hi everybody and welcome to another one of our disastrous misadventures. Before we get started, check out this comic book to get the full scoop on our story so far. George and Harold proudly present the awful truth about Captain Underpants, a Treehouse Comics production. Once upon a time there was two cool kids named George and Harold. We the man! Me too! They had a mean old principal named Mr. Krupp. Grr! Hey bubs! Blah blah blah! One time, Mr. Krupp punished George and Harold. You have to obey my orders. So they got a 3D hypno ring and hypnotized him. No way! You must obey us now! Okay. They made him think he was a superhero. You are now Captain Underpants. Yes, Master. It was supposed to be a joke. Cha-la-la! Ha-ha-ha! But it got carried too far. Window. I will go fight crime now. Way too far. Hey, come back here, bub. Cha-la-la! Then one day he got attacked by a dandelion. Help! Don't you hate when that happens? So George stole some super power juice from a UFO. Ouchie! And gave it to him. Down the hatch, glug glug glug. Suddenly he got superpowers. Hey, I can fly now. I rule! Oh, great. Bomber. Nowadays, whenever Mr. Krupp hears anybody snap their fingers, snap, he turns into you-know-who. Tra-la-la! Uh-oh, not again. And the only way you can stop him is if you pour water on his head. What the? Then he turns back into Mr. Krupp. Hey, what's a big idea, bubs? So whatever you do, don't snap your fingers around Mr. Krupp, okay? The end. Chapter 1, George and Harold. This is George Beard and Harold Hutchins. George is the kid on the left with the tie and the flat top. Harold is the one on the right with the t-shirt and the bad haircut. Remember that now. Please wash your hands after using the toilet. George's and Harold's grades in the school were much like whales in the ocean. They rarely rose above sea level. Melvin Sneedley, however, he's the kid down there with the bow tie and the glasses, always got straight A's. Because Melvin was so academically gifted, people just assumed he was a lot smarter than George and Harold. But that wasn't true. You see, George and Harold were every bit as smart as a straight A students, but in a different way, in a way that couldn't be measured by quizzes or worksheets. Please wash your hands in the toilet. Maybe George and Harold couldn't spell very well or remember their multiplication tables. Perhaps their grammar weren't no good neither. When it came to saving the entire planet from the nasty forces of unrelenting evil, there was nobody better than George Beard and Harold Hutchins. It's a good thing that George and Harold were smart enough to get themselves out of trouble because their silliness was always getting them into trouble. One fact, in time, in, f in fact, one time it got them into a really snotty situation. But before I can tell you that story, I have to tell you this story. Chapter 2, Squishies, Part 1. It was demonstration day in Miss Ribble's fourth grade English class. Every student had to give an oral report demonstrating how to do something. First up were Tim Bronski and Stevie Loopner, who demonstrated how to give a speech that they hadn't prepared for. They got a D minus. Demonstration speeches. Um, uh, hmm. Next up were Jessica Gordon and Stephanie Wyckoff, who demonstrated how to cook frozen lasagna in a pop up toaster. After the firemen left, it was George and Harold's turn. Harold carefully tacked some charts and graphs onto the wall while George brought her out a large garbage can with a toilet seat taped to the top. Ladies and gentlemen, said George, today Harold and I are going to demonstrate how to do a squishy. First, you need two packs of ketchup and a toilet seat. Next, said Harold as he pointed to their display chart, you must fold the ketchup packs in half and carefully place them under the toilet seat. Make sure that the packs are under those front two bumpy thingies on the bottom of the seat. Now, once the ketchup packs are in place, said Harold, all you have to do is wait for somebody to sit down on the toilet seat. Come on, do we have any volunteers? Come on, said George, who wants a squishy? Although nobody in the class wanted to sit on the toilet seat, everybody wanted to see what would happen if somebody actually did. So George grasped one side of the toilet seat, Harold grasped the other, and together they pushed down. Splat! Splat! Everyone in the class was thrilled, except for the two kids sitting directly in front of the toilet seat, who were somewhat less than thrilled. Hooray for squishies, the children shouted. Now, normally, George's and Harold's teacher, Miss Ribble, would have been very angry about this particular demonstration speech. She would have yelled on and on about imitatable behavior and how it's not nice to spray ketchup on a people's underwear. But Miss Ribble had changed quite a bit since the last book, and now she was all about fun! 
Come on, kids, shouted Miss Ripple. Let's all run to the cafeteria and grab some ketchup packs. Squishies for everybody! Hooray! cried the children as they bounded from their seats and dashed toward the classroom door. Not so fast, shouted Melvin Seedley, who stood blocking the door with his arms spread defiantly. You guys are so immature! Chapter 3, The Combiner Tron 2000 Melvin Sneedley, the school brainiac, was not about to let anybody leave the classroom until he had given his demonstration speech. We still have 15 minutes left before lunch, said Melvin, and that's just enough time for me to demonstrate my new invention, the Combinotron 2000. Aw, man, whined Melvin's classmates. The children all slumped back into their seats while Melvin pushed a plastic rolling cart to the front of the classroom. On top of the cart were a hamster, a small robot, which Melvin had built himself, and a strange-looking contraption shaped like an ice cream cone. Today, said Melvin, I will demonstrate how to turn an ordinary hamster into your own very own bionic cyber slave. Melvin placed his pet hamster, Sulu, at one end of the cart and his tiny homemade robot at the other end. I shall now combine this ordinary hamster with this tiny robot using the Combinatron 2000. Melvin picked up the Combinatron 2000 and turned it on. A high-pitched tone pierced the classroom air getting higher and higher in frequency as the machine charged to full power. Melvin typed some last-minute calculations into the keyboard on the side of the Combinatron 2000 as its laser extractor warmed up. Suddenly, two streaks of red glowing light flashed onto Sulu and the tiny robot. The Combinatron 2000 began assimilating information on the two elements as it was about to combine. Don't worry, kids, said Melvin. This procedure is totally painless. Sulu won't feel a thing. Finally, a computerized voice started the countdown. Combining two elements in five seconds. Combining two elements in four seconds. Combining two elements in three seconds. Combining two elements in two seconds. Combining two elements in one second. BLAST! A burst of brilliant white light shot out of the Combinatron 2000 and formed a ball of energy between Sulu and the tiny robot. The hamster and the robot began to slide closer and closer together until they disappeared into the energy ball. The smell of burned matches and pickle relish filled the air as hot blasts of electric wind knocked books off shelves and sent papers flying. Suddenly, there was a blinding flash of light, a quick puff of smoke, and it was all over. Melvin pulled off his goggles. No longer were a hamster and a robot sitting on the cart before him. Now the hamster and robot were one, combined at a cellular level. The world's first self-contained, warm-blooded, fuzzy bionic cyborg. Eureka! shouted Melvin. It worked! I've created a cybernetic life form! The children looked on as Melvin waved a metal detector over the hamster and the reading went off the chart. One of the children raised his hand with a question. Yes, said Melvin enthusiastically. Can we go to the lunchroom and get our ketchup packs now? But no, screamed Melvin. Will you forget about squishies for one minute? I've just created the world's first cybernetic hamster, and nobody is leaving this room until I've demonstrated his undying obedience. Chapter 4, Bad Sulu. Sulu didn't seem to know that he had just undergone a groundbreaking transformation. He didn't act any different. He just wandered across the top of the plastic rolling cart, sniffing everything around him, only stopping occasionally to scratch his ears or rub his whiskers. But poor Sulu was in for a big surprise. Sulu, said Melvin, I'm your master, and you will obey my commands. I want you to demonstrate your new powers for the class. Do a super bionic jump across the room. Sulu did not resp respond. Sulu, said Melvin sternly, crush that plastic roller cart in your bare paws. Sulu did not respond. Sulu, Melvin shouted, go outside, pick up a car, and throw it across the parking lot. Sulu did not respond. Finally, Melvin reached into his book bag and took out a red ping pong paddle he had designed especially for this occasion. Sulu, he said angrily, do as I say or you're going to get a good spanking. This time, Sulu did respond. When he saw the ping-pong paddle, he became very frightened, and his little hamster instincts took over. Sulu jumped into the air, grabbed the ping-pong paddle in his right paw, and then yanked Melvin onto the plastic rolling cart with his left paw. The children finally stopped thinking about ketchup packs and toilets for a moment and settled in to watch a show. Chapter 5, The Incredibly Graphic Violence Chapter, Part 1, in Flipperama. Warning, the... Warning, the following chapter contains graphic depictions of a mean little boy getting spanked by a bionic hamster. 
While this event is presented for humorous effect, the producers of this book acknowledge that hamster attacks are no laughing matter. If you or someone you love has been the victim of a hamster attack, we strongly urge you to get local get help by seeking out a local support group in your area or by visiting www.whenhamstersattack.com. The problem with incredibly graphic violence is that it's hardly ever fun. Well, all that has changed since the invention of Flipperama. Check it out! Spanks for the memories. Chapter 6, The Aftermath. Although Sulu hadn't really spanked Melvin very hard, Melvin wailed and blubbered and carried on anyway. You're a bad hamster, Melvin cried. I never want to see you again as long as I live. Melvin ran out of the classroom sobbing. The rest of the class, including Miss Rebel, followed him out laughing and chanting, Squishies! 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 But George and Harold stayed behind to comfort the forgotten hamster. Don't feel bad, Sulu, said George. Melvin is a real meanie. Yeah, said Harold. Do you want to come home with us? You can live up in our treehouse. Sulu jumped into Harold's arms and gave him a hug. Then he jumped into George's arms and hugged him, too. I think we just adopted a bionic hamster, said Harold. So George tucked their new pal into his shirt pocket and their three friends went off to lunch. Chapter 7, Mr. Krupp. About that very same time, the school principal, Mr. Krupp, came marching into the office in a particularly foul mood. He stopped beside Miss Anthrop's desk, huffing and puffing. Where's my coffee, Edith? He shouted. Go get yourself, Tubby, Miss Anthrop shouted back. I don't need your lip today, woman, Mr. Krupp growled. I just want my coffee and I want it now. Well, give me a cup, too, while you're at it, Miss Anthrop growled back. Ah! screamed Mr. Krupp in frustration as he grabbed a newspaper and headed for the faculty restroom. Miss Ribble was standing beside the restroom door, smiling and trying very hard not to laugh. What are you looking at? Mr. Krupp snarled as he pushed his way past Miss Ribble and slammed the restroom door behind him. Inside the restroom, you could hear the faint sound of a belt buckle jingling, a zipper unzipping, some clothes rustling, and finally... What the? screamed... Splat, splat. What the? screamed Mr. Krupp from inside the restroom. I've got ketchup in my underwear. In a few moments, the door of the faculty restroom flew open. I'm going to get George and Harold for this, Mr. Krupp screamed. They didn't do it, laughed Miss Ribble. I did. It's called a squishy. It's the latest fad. Yeah, right. Very funny, said Mr. Krupp. Now, where are those two kids? I just know they're responsible. As Mr. Krupp headed for the cafeteria, he noticed that he wasn't the only person to fall victim to the dreaded squishies. All through the hallway, angry 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 5th, and 6th graders were complaining about ketchup stains on their pants, socks, legs, and underwear. Mr. Krupp stormed into the cafeteria and headed for the 4th graders' table. George and Harold, shouted Mr. Krupp. I've got ketchup in my underwear because of you two. And so do half of the kids in this school. We didn't do it, said Harold. Yeah, said a few of the other fourth graders. George and Harold are innocent. Oh, no, they're not, said a voice from the other end of the table. It was Melvin Sneedley. Besides being the school brainiac, Melvin was also famous for being the school tattletale. George and Harold taught everybody a trick today where you put ketchup packs under a toilet seat and make it spring on people's legs. Melvin reported proudly. Thank you, Melvin, said Mr. Krupp. He turned to George and Harold and pointed at the cafeteria door. Mr. Beard and Mr. Hutchins, out! Chapter 8. The comic is mightier than the spitball. George and Harold were sent straight to the detention room. Man, said Harold, Melvin is such a tattletale. Somebody ought to teach him a lesson, and we're just the guys to do it, said George. So George and Harold create an all-new comic book featuring everybody's favorite tattletale and meanie, Melvin Sneedley. When they were done, the two boys sneaked out of the detention room to run off copies of their latest work and sell them in the hallway. The new comic book was a great success. Everybody loved it. Well, everybody but Melvin Sneedley, I should say. As Melvin walked to his last class of the day, he noticed small groups of students in the hallway reading comics together and giggling. Normally, this was enough to make Melvin run straight to the principal office and tell on everybody for unsupervised reading, which was strictly forbidden. But today, Melvin noticed something strange. The comic reading students were pointing and laughing at him. What? said Melvin. What's wrong? What are you guys laughing at? Melvin looked around the hallway desperately. 
Everybody was laughing, everybody was pointing, and it was driving Melvin crazy. He marched over to a group of second graders, grabbed the comic book out of their hands, and looked at the cover. Melvin was furious. You guys are so immature, shrieked Melvin. He quickly darted off to read the comic in peace, but everywhere he ran, he came across more pointing and more laughing. Finally, Melvin thought of the one place he could read the comic in private. He went into the boys' bathroom, locked himself in one of the stalls, and sat down to read. Splat! Splat! As Melvin sat reading, his legs dripping with ketchup, he, he became angrier and angrier. I'm gonna get George and Harold, Melvin vowed. Chapter 9, Captain Underpants and the Terrifying Tale of the Tattletron 2000. Duh, by George Beard and Harold Hutchins. Captain Underpants and the Terrifying Tale of the Tattletron 2000. Once upon a time, there was a dumb kid named Melvin who was a big tattletale. I'm telling, Kip off the grass. Everywhere he went, he caused grief and misery. I'm telling, no skateboarding. Until one day, I'm telling, crash. Hey, cops, that guy just robbed the bank. Gee, thanks, kid. You're under arrest. Hey, kid, you solved the crime of the century. And so, daily news, dumb kid is a hero. Everybody loves Melvin. Melvin had become so popular that he decided to run for mayor. I'm telling Melvin for mayor. Vote for Melvin. Confetti. Melvin for mayor. My hero. Vote for a hero. He won in a landslide victory. Daily news. Dumb kid becomes mayor. Congratulations. You're the youngest mayor ever. Yes, and I'm going to make some big changes. Soon, Mayor Melvin made a bunch of dumb new laws. No humming, no smiling, no reading signs, no talking, no wedgies, no stinky feet, no marveling at nature, no burping, no stopping to smell the roses. And people were getting arrested left and right. You're under arrest, but I didn't do anything. Busted! No saying, but I didn't do anything. And they all got sent to jail. Ha ha! Suddenly, Mayor Melvin, all the jails are full. Hmm, I will build a big robo jail and catch those lawbreakers myself. So he built the Chattletron 2000. Clang, clang. Hmm? Soon, Mayor Melvin was off catching lawbreakers. That'll teach you. Then Melvin headed for the school. Help, the Tattletron 2000 just ran across the soccer field and squished it in, teacher. Oh no, we just planted that grass. This looks like a job for... Crash! Captain Underpants! What's up, bub? Look out! Oh, you're going to jail for busting the roof. But Captain Underpants was faster than a speeding waistband. Zip, no zipping. More powerful than boxer shorts. No crashing through signs. And able to leap tall buildings without getting a wedgie. No using the same joke over and over. Captain Underpants wanted to fight the robot, but he didn't want to hurt the people inside. Then he got an idea. Mrs. Plop's Prune Juice Factory. Crash. Hey! What the? Uh-oh. We're, we're free! Ugh. Soon there was nobody left inside the Tattletron 2000 except for Melvin. Uh-oh. Pow! I'm telling! And so, hooray for Captain Underpants! You guys are so immature! Then everybody got sent free! Tra-la-la! We're free and stuff! Yay! Yippee! Goo goo! Rough! Meow! Ribbit! The end! Chapter 10 Mad Mr. Melvin Melvin was furious. He ripped the comic book in half and tossed it over his shoulder. Then he washed his hands in the toilet and stormed out of the restroom. I'm gonna get George and Harold for that, said Melvin. I'm going to teach him a lesson they'll never forget. After school, Melvin grabbed his Combinatron 2000 and headed home. Melvin's mother and father were both busy working on a top-secret government experiment when Melvin walked in the front door. Hello, son, said Melvin's father. How's your day at school? Terrible, said Melvin. Nobody in school has sufficient respect for my beautiful mind. Those dull-witted, lame-brained, gum-chewing idiots are more impressed with comic books than they are with the wonders of science. But I shall teach them. I shall teach them all. Ha 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 ha! That's nice, honey, said Melvin's mom. Melvin marched up to his room to begin building a brand new superpowered robot. But when he opened his bedroom's door, the, he saw the family's pet cat, Danderella, sleeping quietly on his bed. Hey, Melvin screamed, what are you doing in my room, you stupid cat? You know I'm allergic to you. Now get out and uh, uh, I choose, stay out. 
After a few hours, Melvin had built his newest and most powerful robot ever, which had three sets of interchangeable laser eyeballs, macro-hydraulic jumpatronic legs, and super subgobulating automo arms, and an extendable octoclaw rib cage, and was powered by three separate twin turbo 9000 SP5 Kung Fu Titanium Lithium Alloy processors, which were all built into a virtually indestructible flexogromonic endoskeleton that had the power to crush through cinder blocks, crush steel in its vise like grasp, and plow mercilessly through poorly written run on sentences. It could also slice bagels. That ought to do the trick, said Melvin, wiping his nose on a tissue. Now all I have to do is, uh, achoo! Combine my body with this bionic robot and I shall be the most powerful boy who, uh, achoo! Ever lived! <laughs>